Good evening and welcome to the fifth episode of our virtual seminar series this year, starting a new phase of our pandemic dialogues tonight, the Reckoning and Recovery series. I'm Paul Carice, the Director of the School of Civic and Economic Thought and Leadership at Arizona State University. Our school launched this series to provide perspective on our current public health and civic crisis through conversations among our school's faculty and students and expert guests and a wider community. Tonight's webinar is on the topic of the Great Depression, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and the New Deal emergency in America. Part of our school's mission is to promote civic dialogue about pressing issues of our time. And each academic year, we have a speaker series, the Civic Discourse Project, which extends the conversations and debates of our classrooms to a broader community. Arizona PBS records those speaker events and broadcasts them. You can visit our website to see all of our previous lectures in the Civic Discourse Project at scetl.asu.edu. And we're offering the pandemic dialogues this spring and summer in two modes. This series of live webinars discussing a deeper perspective on pandemics or civic crisis, and also a podcast discussing Albert Camus' novel, The Plague. More information on these webinars on the Camus podcast, <clears throat> on the, the, the Camus podcast and also information on our school is again at our website, skettle.asu.edu. So to begin this new series of discussions of reckoning and recovery, we're delighted to welcome an expert on the American presidency and ideas of great presidential leadership, Professor Mark Landy of Boston College. Then joining me to pose questions to Professor Landy is my colleague in the School of Civic and Economic Thought and leadership, Sean Bienberg. We'll have three parts to the webinar, as is our custom, an opening presentation for Professor Landy, then questions for him from Sean Bienberg and myself, then in part three, a Q&A session from the virtual community that's joining us. So please do type your questions for our guest using the Q&A feature in Zoom. And behind the scenes, our colleague, Luke Perez, will collect the questions, then Sean and I will take turns posing those on your behalf to our guest. You can also use the hashtag pandemic dialogues on Twitter to participate in this discussion as well. Our guest is Mark Landy, professor of political science at Boston College and the academic chair of BC's Irish Institute. He is the co-author with Sid Milkus of Presidential Greatness, which is a book studying ambition and leadership in our constitution's executive office. FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, is one of the presidents they classify as achieving lasting changes and great leadership for government, for political parties, and for American politics. Mark is also the author of a textbook, American Government, Enduring Principles, Critical Choices. And Professor Landy has authored or co-edited several books and many articles about the presidency, federalism, public policy, and federal regulation of the environment and the economy. My colleague, Sean Bienberg, is an assistant professor of politics in our school. Before coming to ASU, he taught at Haverford College and Lehigh University. His teaching and research interests include the US Constitution and constitutional law, Arizona constitutionalism, federalism and state constitutionalism and politics, and executive power, both presidential and gubernatorial. He is the author of the book, Prohibition, the Constitution and States' Rights, and he's finishing another book on states as constitutional interpreters in the progressive and New Deal eras. And he's also the project director of our school's initiative to build a new website, a living repository of the Arizona Constitution. So with that, Professor Landy, thank you so much for joining us. And we now look forward to your remarks on the Great Depression, FDR, and the New Deal emergency in America. This great nation will endure as it has endured, will revive, and will prosper. So, first of all, let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Nameless, unreasoning, unjustified terror which paralyzes needed efforts to convert retreat into advance. FDR started his 
take on the great on combating the Great Depression by telling Americans what their situation was psychologically, how they should think, how they should feel about what's going on. They have nothing to fear but fear itself. And there is in FDR's rhetoric a powerful way of defining the situation in ways that Americans could begin to think would get them out of this depression. Nobody understood the depression. I mean, nobody. Certainly not FDR, certainly not the ordinary American. And so the first thing he wanted to get on people's minds is you can't be paralyzed yourself. And you have to trust me. Okay. Another very crucial thing he said, actually, even before he was president, but when he was a leading contender, it was a speech he gave at a commencement in Oglethorpe University in, in Georgia. Um, this country needs, and unless I mistake its temper, the country demands bold, persistent experimentation. It is common sense to take a method and try it. If it fails, admit it frankly and try another. But above all, try something. The millions who are in want will not stand by silently forever while things to satisfy their needs are within easy reach. Bold, persistent experimentation. The president had been considered to be many things in the past, but experimenter in chief? I think we have to see that this is an aspect of FDR's leadership where he's really expanding the office. He knows that he will be judged. The, the ability to cope with this depression will either make him a successful president or kill him. He knows what happened to Hoover. Hoover was enormously popular before the depression. Hoover actually tried some meaningful things to combat the, the depression, but he didn't engage in bold and persistent experimentation. And in some ways that's the key to FDR is you try one thing, it doesn't work, you try something else. The other thing that FDR did at the very onset was to define the enemy. Who is responsible for this thing? He wants, he's rousing people's positive emotions and telling them to, con to contradict their fears. Uh, in some ways, he's mobilizing less pleasant emotions in defining the enemy. Compared, well, I'm, I'm going to skip part of this because it's a bit long. Primarily, the, the fault, this is because the rulers of the exchange of mankind's goods have failed. Business has failed. Through their own stubbornness and their own incompetence, they've abdicated. Practices of the unscrupulous money changers stand indicted in the court of public opinion unscrupulous money changers, right? This is a biblical illusion. Um, it's not uh, uh, the most pleasant uh, illusion for a Jewish person to hear, but FDR was no anti-Semite. Um, so he's, he's explaining, he's, he's telling the public what this is all about. And he makes a kind of threat. In the event that Congress shall fail to take one of our, the courses that's necessary, and in the event that the national emergency is still critical, I shall not evade the clear course of duty that will then confront me. I shall ask Congress for the one remaining instrument to meet the crisis, broad executive power to wage a war against the emergency. He's not averse to, to, demand, to asking for emergency powers, but of course he would be demanding uh, emergency powers. And that, um, uh, that's something that never got tested because Congress essentially gave him everything he wanted in the early days of, of, the, of the crisis. And so uh, that didn't get tested, but it was there as a threat. So all this is on the table. This is what he's telling the American public. This is how he's situating the crisis. 
So what, what took place? What took place? And here I'm going to quote a, a, a much more recent political figure, uh, uh, Obama's first chief of staff, Rahm Emanuel, who famously said, never let a crisis go to waste. It's an opportunity to do things that you think you could not do before. Right? What, what, this is, a, this is a, a Machiavellian advice to, a, to an ambitious leader. Right. You've got an emergency here. If you, if you handle the emergency, the public's going to give you credit and you can move mountains. And this is where, this is where the, the whole question of the New Deal and the New Deal as, an, as a response to the Depression uh, uh, gets complicated, uh, but very interesting. Because the New Deal was really four things. And I can distinguish them, and I will distinguish them for you analytically. But the key to Roosevelt's political success, and after all, he won four elections, you have to give him uh, a certain amount of credit there, uh, was how he, com how he combined these things politically so that he could take advantage of the emergency uh, to accomplish big things that were on his mind. And Roosevelt was a visionary. Roosevelt had transformative ambitions, uh, and to some extent, uh, he succeeded in them. Um, so let's start with the direct emergency response. There's a whole series of efforts that take place very quickly in the New Deal and are expanded rapidly. Um, and the, the signature policy that it takes a little while, the names change for a while, but what emerges as the signature emergency response that actually accomplishes something is the Works Progress Administration, the WPA, which was an extraordinarily innovative and ambitious effort of government to put people to work. Federal government had never put people to work who weren't uh, civil servants, but, but starting in 1935, exp expanding on what had been uh, pioneered before, $4.9 billion, that was real money in those days, about 6.7% of the gross domestic product of the, product of the country. At its peak, the WPA employed 3 million people. In total, over the course of its history, it employed more than 8 million people, men and women, um, including African Americans. And I, I want to make this point uh, very clear. This is really the first time the government has done anything meaningful for African Americans since the end of Reconstruction. African Americans were represented in the WPA and more or less in their, per, in their percentages in the population. Uh, 425,000 African Americans. Now, women, uh, women's role was maybe not uh, as great because there was a principle of one, one breadwinner per family. So only female uh, single single female uh, families uh, was the woman eligible uh, for a job. So you know, by contemporary standards, that doesn't uh, maybe sit so well. Massive employment. And of course, big issues had to be settled. Um, the biggest one was what are these people going to do um, and there was tremendous dis, uh, dissension within the administration about how carefully the jobs had to be um, created. So w w were important things going to be done? Were great dams going to be built? Well, there was some of that, but, but Harry Hopkins, who emerged as FDR's chief advisor, uh, actually, um, in the New Deal and World War II in many ways, said, no, you can't do it. We can't put millions of people to work quickly if we're too scrupulous. You got to make a decision. And so lots of people went to work doing some very 
strange things. My favorite example is my best friend in elementary school's parents, Ichabod and Pauline Klasfeld, were put to work teaching fencing. The two of them, they could barely walk, and there they were uh, teaching fencing. Well, you know, a lot of this went on, but FDR was committed. People would go to work. There would not, they would not get money if they didn't work. He understood the dignity of the American worker was paramount, and he could not risk any kind of depletion of morale, any kind of loss of that sense of personal worth uh, that, that comes from working. Okay, another aspect of the New Deal uh, was the building of American infrastructure. Great projects were undertaken. They didn't substitute for the jobs programs, but in addition to the jobs program, the Bonneville Dam, the Tennessee Valley Authority, rural electrification. A tiny percentage of American farms were electrified before the New Deal, uh, and within a, a matter of a very few years, most farms were electrified. This is quite, quite an undertaking. Okay. And then there's a whole other aspect uh, of the New Deal. And it came from a just rather dreadful misunderstanding. So if FDR had great psychological insights and brilliant political insights, uh, he was no economist. And he bought into an idea that had become popular during the progressive era that America had um, outgrow was not going to grow anymore, that the rate of growth was going to decline, uh, the frontier was closing, uh, there were too many factories, we were able to produce more than our people could possibly consume. And so, uh, in words that he used in another famous one of his speeches, the Commonwealth Club Address, uh, the, time had, the time had passed for massive improvement in the economy, and the goal now had to be enlightened administration. And so as important as WPA was in, in addressing the Depression, the signature policy of the early days of the, of the New Deal was something called the National Industrial Recovery Act which was literally an effort not to take over the economy, but to rein in the market, to get codes written whereby businesses would pledge to keep prices up, to keep wages up, to not compete with one another, uh, so that there could be a kind of stabilization of the economy. And this got enormous attention, it got, uh, it was, I think, FDR's favorite program, uh, and it was a complete bust. It was useless because, as I think many of you are well aware, trying to control market forces uh, is not doable. It pays to cheat. And although government and so-called enlightened administration was getting very involved in, in this process, uh, there wasn't the stomach to really coerce businesses. And so businesses, uh, you know, they signed on, they, they wore the Blue Eagle badge, and they cheated. And really, the New Deal was saved by the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court, in its wisdom, declared the National Industrial Recovery Act to be unconstitutional. Uh, and it was an enormous blemish. Uh, FDR was furious. It shows that his judgment was not impeccable. Um, but uh, the, thing, the thing went away. But this notion of a planned economy, of reigning in an economy that has matured, was a very important aspect of the New Deal. Uh, and on the whole, I think, uh, 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 not a productive aspect. Um, do I still have some time? How much time? Do I have like five minutes? Ten minutes? Five. Okay. Speed up a little bit. Programmatic rights, right? When we think of the New Deal, we think either of the emergency that it coped with or we think about its 
most enduring public policy legacy, which of course is social security. And what FDR said, he said this before in a campaign speech, he said, Americans are famous for their love of rights. We love our liberties, we love our rights, and now we have to add a right. We have to add economic security because times have changed, the world has changed, and it's now incumbent upon government to protect the rights of those who can't protect themselves, by which he meant the elderly. And social, social security pensions became uh, a fundamental principle of the New Deal and of course uh, uh, survives to this day. But look how it changed the notion of rights. Before social security, rights meant what the government couldn't do to you, deprive you of your speech, of your freedom of religious expression, of your right to assemble. Since the New Deal, we have pioneered in the New Deal the idea of rights as something that government provides, social security. And then of course, as a result of the 60s of, of the Johnson administration, Medicare. And so much of the, the discussion about what government should or should, should do uh, is couched in, in, in the term of rights, right? Shouldn't we have a right to a healthy and safe environment? Uh, shouldn't everybody have a right to health care? This is the kind of discussion that we engage in uh, and that I think we owe uh, an awful lot uh, uh, to FDR uh, and the New Deal. So what endures? What endures is the great infrastructural improvements. What endures is the programmatic rights. Um, what doesn't endure is this effort to cartelize the economy, right? Uh, although even there we see a tremendous interest, a much, much expanded notion of uh, enlightened administration. Uh, what did the New Deal accomplish? It decreased misery, it decreased fear, it gave millions of people dignified work. What didn't it do? It didn't fully escape the depression. It took World War II to pull that off. Uh, and it it lessened unemployment, but certainly didn't bring it back down uh, to 1920s levels. Okay, look forward to your questions. Thank you for that, Professor Landy. Um, that sets the table for a very interesting uh, conversation. So we will move now to uh, Sean Byenberg and I uh, posing questions to you. I do want to remind the audience that in part three of the webinar, we have a chance for you to pose questions to our guest, Mark Landy. So please type those into the Q&A function in Zoom, and then those will be transmitted to Sean and myself, and we'll pose those to Professor Landy. So um, Mark, I always lose the coin toss, and, and my colleague in the department always gets to pose the first question. So Sean, over to you. Sure. So to what extent did uh, Roosevelt's administration simply put into practice uh, and make permanent the wartime emergency politics and constitutionalism uh, of Woodrow Wilson and his progressive theorizing from 20 years before. So to what extent was it a continuation or an update of that? And to what extent did it differ from Wilson's constitutional and political thinking? Well, okay, I, I, I'm gonna refer to two things that I, that I said in my talk. Bold and persistent experimentation. FDR was prepared to try almost everything. And um, the idea of, the, as I say, the big bust of the, of the uh, National Industrial Recovery Administration, I think didn't come out of Wilson. Uh, it, it, it was akin to ideas that Herbert Hoover was very interested in. I mean, there was in the air in the 20s uh, among people who thought of themselves as progressives, and Hoover did, some idea that unbridled competition couldn't work anymore. Its day had passed. Uh, and that, that, that's what I, I call it the maturity thesis. It's sometimes referred to as the stagnation thesis. So I think that's an idea that doesn't, what comes, what, what you saw in World War I was really government imposing itself on the private sector to make munitions, to make, uh, to, to, to provide the wherewithal for the war. 
And by the way, I think FDR wasn't an unbridled fan of that approach because when when he had to prosecute a war in World War II, he took a very different approach. For all the panoply of bureaucratic organizations involved in the war effort, the basic rule of thumb in the war effort was bribery of the industrial sector. We will make you rich if you make the tanks. We will, we will give you cost plus contracts. If you've ever been in business, could there be anything more beautiful than a cost plus contract? In other words, charge me what, uh, whatever things are gonna cost you, add it up and add 10% and I'll pay it. So you have no influence, you don't, you don't need to be tough on your workers, you don't need to be tough on your suppliers. Uh, World War II was won with this remarkable subsidization of industry and industry responded magnificently. So, uh, you know, a lot, there were a lot, a lot of carryover personnel from that World War I experience. And I think they would have liked to see even more in the direction of a kind of regimentation of the economy. Uh, but ultimately they didn't have their way. Could I, could I just pose a follow-up question about, before I pose my own uh, question to that, would, in a way, Woodrow Wilson doesn't have the same good luck that FDR has, in a way, that the, the war, the, the great war in Europe is in a way successful for Woodrow Wilson, having said for years he wouldn't get us involved in a European war, and then he does, and it turns out we are the decisive uh, influence for victory for roughly the liberal democracies or something like that. At any rate, but but he, he in a way he kind of loses or fumbles the piece, right? He has he has bad luck at the end. You were just suggesting in a way FDR beyond his own planning did have some good luck. The Supreme Court striking down the weakest part of his experimentation, and then in a in a bizarre way, the good luck to use it in a bizarre sense of the international crisis and the world war coming along to fully pull the economy out of the depression and actually also to set him up to do what no president had ever done before, have a third term, which yeah. uh, I, I, not for the international crisis would, would not have happened, right? Carice, why do I have to agree with you? That gives me a very short answer. No, I think that's exactly right. I, I think FDR had a lot of luck. Uh, his other dreadful idea, court packing, was slammed down, and that preserved a certain constitutional sanity and sobriety to the New Deal that, that, that might have been very much at risk. I mean, the, you know, the New Deal is a delicate balance. Um, it never somehow uh, overflows its banks in an anti-constitutional direction, but I'm not sure that wasn't always for lack of trying. <laughs> uh, he also, I, I think uh, the reputation of the New Deal benefits to some extent from the conservative turn in the 38 uh, congressional elections that, that maybe keeps some uh, things from happening. So I'm going to now pose my own uh, question to you. Uh, we, we had agreed beforehand not to talk too much about the current COVID crisis and, and civic crisis in America, but I, I want to get at that indirectly by addressing the question of measuring or expecting greatness from either presidents or governors. Uh, so we have a lot of commentary, obviously, in the media about how the President Trump is performing, how various governors are performing in response to this current crisis. And, and I want to focus not so much on what's being said in, in, by media per se, but by our academic colleagues and what they expect of executive leadership, presidents and governments. So you, you have broad scholarly basis on which to uh, think about these questions. You've studied the history and development of the presidency from, from George Washington to the present. Uh, you, you've also written on the modern administrative state and how administrative agencies of the federal government actually function. So my, my question is, do, do you think that some of our academic colleagues have unrealistically high expectations of, of every president and every governor and of, of government capacity generally, uh, capacity in ordinary times, capacity in 
in crisis. And, and sort of a subset of that is, 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 is this over expectation, too high expectations, part of our, our polarizing that, that you know, half of the electorate just thinks every governor or every president is a loser because they're not great uh, and we're caught in this polarization cycle. Right, the, the, the standards, uh, so there are transformative moments, and, but we, I think we've only had two uh, in, in, since, uh, since the Constitutional Convention. We had the Civil War and uh, to, to a lesser extent, but probably still a significant extent, the New Deal. And uh, those have been moments where I do think a certain kind of greatness was required. Uh, I don't think a, a mediocre president could have prosecuted the Civil War. Um, that's really the great example. Let, 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 let's stick to that one. So what do we want from executives most of the time? I think we want, above all, constitutional sobriety. Our constitution is a, is a remarkably well thought out, not just document, but framework for, uh, for carrying on our business. And um, the, the unfortunate instinct to um, person, so uh, Theodore Lowy called, uh, coined this term, the personalized presidency, that somehow the president should be the most important figure in our lives, you know, outside our immediate family, and maybe, uh, who, uh, you know, Tom Brady, who, you know, who, 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 who should we care about? Uh, it's too much. It's too much. I think it's been kind of impressive uh, in this recent crisis to see governors take more on. Even there, uh, the expectations are, I think, too high uh, in, in, in many cases, but there is something appropriate in our federal system to see so much of the burden uh, of, of dealing with this, this pandemic fall on, the, on shoulders that are probably best placed to deal with it for the most part. Um, and so the trouble is, once this, once this uh, genie is out, of the, is, is out of the box, it's hard to put it back. How, how we could begin to think more, more calmly about the executive branch, how we could somehow resuscitate the legislative branch, which after all, James Madison said was the, you know, the heart of the matter in a representative form of government. It does seem to me it's got to be our representative, our most representative branch that, uh, that should be closest to our hearts. Uh, I, I don't have answers for that, Paul, but, that, but I, I, I so sympathize with the spirit of your question. Great, and uh, Sean, your turn. We're gonna kind of continuing off of Paul's question here. So, a lot of constitutional historians argue that the consolidation of power in the presidency, sometimes this is called the imperial presidency, in which it's collapsing power that used to be either at the states or at Congress, that's heavily derived from um, the New Deal in its era. So um, first question, I guess, just I, I suspect I know your answer to this one, but uh, do you agree with that? Is this consolidation of power in the presidency uh, largely based in the New Deal? Um, and more generally, do you think that the consolidation of power in the presidency um, whether that's from domestic emergencies or you could maybe foreign policy as well, the Cold War is a kind of emergency, but do you think that the consolidation of power that we've seen in the last 70 years, 50 years, whatever metric you want, has been on the whole positive or a negative development for our civic and constitutional health? Wow, that's tough. <laughs> um, so, so much has been forced onto the president the wars, the, the, the initial new depression emergency, um, the, the, the Cold War. The, 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 this requires the kind of, of, of active and powerful presidency that we have. I, I don't see how you could run uh, the, world's, uh, the world's greatest power in, 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 in international matters uh, with less than the powerful presidency that we have. 
On the domestic side, I, it's gotten, uh, it's overblown. It's overblown. And, you know, we can, we can lay some of that, we can lay a lot of that at the, uh, at the door of, uh, of FDR, but um, I would lay a lot at the door of, of Lyndon Baines Johnson um, for somehow thinking that the national government can be quite as, can do on the domestic side uh, what it can and indeed has to do on the, on the foreign policy side. Now that, that leaves enormous dangers and difficulties uh, uh, to have such a powerful foreign policy, national security presidency, but that I see as inevitable. Thanks. So uh, we now turn to part three. We remind our, our uh, virtual audience to use the Q&A function uh, in Zoom to send in some questions. We have some questions already from the audience. Uh, I'm gonna start, um, Mark, and then Sean, you can be ready to go to ask the, the next round, uh, transferring these from our audience. So Mark, the, the, I'm gonna put together two questions from audience members that have to do with your remark about programmatic rights as a major element of, of the, the New Deal emergency response uh, to, the, to the depression. So uh, our friend Roy Miller uh, asks a question about this new positive right of a, of a of security, social security pension benefit or any other kind of uh, welfare benefit. And another uh, anonymous uh, question asks about this, um, as academics would call it, this distinction between negative rights and positive rights. So um, our friend Roy Miller is taking sort of the traditional classical liberal view. There are only negative rights, as you mentioned. Government is prevented uh, from doing something and that's a protection of individual rights. So do you, do you think Roosevelt, the you know, progressives and then Roosevelt and the New Deal in, in in, invented within American politics this idea of positive rights, and and did 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 what was their response to the obvious sort of criticism coming from classical liberals, negative rights uh, views that um, somebody's got to pay. A positive right is a burden on individuals who have to pay for somebody else's new positive uh, right. When you say where uh, where was the response? I mean, I think we have to note the extraordinary popularity of Social Security and Medicare with the American public. Um, is this the best way to do this sort of thing? Uh, probably not. It seems to me an insurance, uh, a scheme for old age pensions could have been devised that didn't root itself in this concept of programmatic rights. I, I think that, that would have been better. Uh, this is FDR the Machiavel. He didn't want to seem like he was doing something radically new. Um, and we live with that. Um, I think we have to, you know, this is a case where maybe in the abstract, uh, a better a better route would have been to, to create an old age pension scheme and call it a pension scheme and, and uh, and 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 make uh, have it on budget, uh, on the congressional budget, and certainly I, I would make the same claim about Medicare. So um, this Just is to be clear, right? Because what 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 happens uh, basically intentionally is that it's a generational transfer. It's a generational oh, yeah. transfer. Yeah, it's not a pay-as-you-go scheme. Either either Social Security and or the other components of it, Medicare in particular. Yeah, they're not pay-as-you-go schemes, and of course, Medicare has now become uh, unsupported, unsupportable. I mean, somewhere, uh, probably not in my lifetime, but in the lifetime of you young folks out there, uh, there's going to be a reckoning because the money's not there to do it as, as we're doing it. And it'll, it will involve some, some rather unpleasant cuts in, in um, r raising taxes and cutting benefits are both going to happen. So this is, this is a legacy that, that has very uh, dubious ramifications. 
just a follow up. Uh, so there's an interesting paradox here. You said it's, a, it's true. It's immensely popular. Social Security, uh, someone like Ronald Reagan, right, who, who for more than a decade in, in public life uh, had campaigned against such kind of New Deal uh, programs. Uh, uh, but then as president, he engages in this great compromise with the Democratic Party to, to raise taxes and, and restore some kind of temporary solvency to Social Security because it was so immensely popular. On the other hand, the long-term prospects are difficult because what makes it popular in a way is also what is, makes it not, not properly funded. Uh, yeah, Social Security is much less of a problem than Medicare. Yeah. Because first of all, as the, popul the population doesn't just age, but it also uh, in some ways remains more vigorous, people work longer, so you know you you, you fritz around with the uh, with the age limit. Um, you can you can keep the thing pretty well solvent. But of course, uh, I say this as a great consumer of of healthcare. I mean, you know, it's it's unbelievably expensive. It's great, but we don't often we forget that this problem what we treat as a problem is is a result of this extraordinary improvement. Uh, uh, in longevity, we, we non-smokers don't die anymore. So, um, you know, uh, we can call it a crisis, but we should also see that this is this is in a way um, uh, ways in which our civilization really has uh, uh, has made some remarkable strides. How we're going to pay for it, I don't know. Yeah. Okay, Sean, okay, over to you. Yep. So we have another question that kind of dovetails off this thinking about um, fundamental change or crisis. So uh, is the current state of affairs, which I take to mean probably the COVID stuff, um, is that a blip on the historical timeline or does it represent a fundamental change in American democracy? Well, okay, on some, some matters, the, the, uh, fun, uh, all right, so I'll start with the easy thing. I don't think it's a fundamental change in American democracy. I think that, uh, we will survive this crisis and the uh, basic contours of American politics and government will, will look the same. I, 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 don't, I don't see, I mean, in that sense, it's more akin to a, nat a natural disaster than it is to uh, what happened uh, in the New Deal. On the other hand, there, one wonders how the financial how the financial ship is going to be uh, uh, re uh, uh, is, is is going to is going to function. Um, huge amounts of money have been spent. Uh, huge huge loans to huge grants to the states. What's what's? I'm not sure what the fiscal ramifications of this may be, and that may have some very important telling impact on federalism. It's uh, just a, a, a follow-up. It's interesting to think what would have happened, uh, you know, the great, great his historical what-ifs, if, if a descendant of the New Deal, in some ways of the progressive wing of the Democratic Party, had been president when the COVID crisis hit. You, you referred to uh, Rahm Emanuel, in a way, echoing the spirit of, of FDR, right? Never let a crisis go to waste. Think in transformational terms. It seems that the president and many governors have not wanted to handle it um, as a transformational opportunity, but rather as something more like a natural disaster. Other, other governors and other voices have said, we should use this as a transformational. Uh, and, and by the way, this points to one big difference between this current crisis and the Great Depression. The Great Depression hit everywhere. I mean, you couldn't escape the Great Depression. I mean, individuals could escape it. Some people sold stock uh, early and, and, and you know, made a lot of money in the Great Depression. But regionally speaking, everybody was hit. People, everybody looked to the national government. Even they're really, Republicans uh, disappeared from, <laughs> from, the, from the public stage. Even conservative Southern Democrats, uh, you know, the jobs were necessary. They gave FDR what he wanted. Um, this crisis is very different. Um, you know, I'm in the Northeast. It's really bad. Our governors have been uh, sort of New Dealish in their approach. Um, uh, and 
the 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 constraints that they've put on on our liberties uh, uh, I think in many ways are quite defensible I'm, 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 I, I, we we have a real crisis up here out, out in your part of the country right the, the the cases are much less the the difficulties are are much less I think this is a great stage for federalism whether a a new dealish kind of president could have found the it, it i mean it depends if he had both houses of congress well you know right. say the door you do <laughs> you can do anything um so yes i i think it would have been very different it, so it's interesting after uh two years of the great depression global economic crisis <clears throat> there's an election and it's a wave election uh, what the scholars, as you know, call a realigning election. It changes the whole American party system. And then FDR is able to benefit from the fact that he's consolidated in effect, uh, as you mentioned, the legislative branch and the executive branch, because he has overwhelming majorities yeah. in, in both houses of Congress, so he can he can do things. But that's not our situation. Yeah, ironically, ironically, he doesn't have great victories after 36, because um, the country falls back into a little bit of a recession in 37. Uh, the court packing is unpopular, and um, uh, he can't get he can't make as much headway as as he expected. But of course, he what what makes FDR so special in a way is his political genius, right? Because he fig he understands that the thirty six election is going to really, in some ways, determine the future of American politics. Thirty two is a fluke. Anybody not named Herbert Hoover is going to win in thirty two. But by 36, he builds, and of course, especially that is the extraordinary alliance that he forms with the labor movement, which, which then was the, 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 the fundament of the most successful party organization in American history. Right? Last, the New Deal Democratic Party prevailed at least through 68. Yes. And African Americans and other other parts of the of, of the American political landscape, he he forges this new coalition out of crisis. Yeah. Yes. Now the Afri the political payoff of African Americans doesn't come for a while because he he doesn't do anything on civil rights, and so the it's only in selected northern industrial states that he benefits from the his ability to to obtain the allegiance of African Americans. But then you know once the 65 Voting Rights Act happens, it's, it's a great moment for the, for the Democrats. So we have another uh, audience question. This is from our colleague, uh, Trevor Shelley. Um, you referred earlier in remarks about the psychologization of, of politics, fear needing to be openly addressed and uh, placing trust and confidence in the leader uh, to, to take us out of a state of paralysis. Is, is there a connection, uh, both good and bad, between this, this uh, placing of psychology, a nation psychology, a leader psychology at the center of politics, and the, the consolidation of power uh, with good and bad aspects uh, that we've talked about, especially consolidation of, of executive power? Well, good or bad, it seems to me it's inevitable. And so a a talented executive is going to think through what is the what does the public have to understand about what's going on now that at the highest level that's civic education that's the name of your college um, but short of that it at least it's incumbent it seems to me on the executive to feel the pulse of the public and make some kind of what's the problem? I have to define it for you. How should we think of it? I have to define it for you. I mean, we, we, to that extent, I mean, as much as I want to resuscitate the Congress, you know, we're, we're never going to make the president a clerk again. Yes. <laughs> if we ever, if he ever was, which he really wasn't, but yes, yes, yes. yes. We have kind of a related question from our other postdoctoral fellow, uh, Aaron Kushner. How do you assess the fireside chats as useful tools in mitigating fear during crises? Uh, does the president have a responsibility to reach out and assuage fear? 
I, I, I would say that the answer to that is yes. That the fireside chats were remarkable, that FDR, first of all, understood the medium. He understood what radio was about. Radio was an intimate medium. And so you don't give lectures on radio. You don't, you don't, uh, you're, you're not hortatory on radio. You're, you're in people, particularly in those days, right? Because the, the radio was in the parlor. People sat around, uh, you know, the, the, the parents, the kids, the golden retriever, they sat there and listened. And FDR understood that he was entering their parlor uh, and he had to conduct himself in a certain way. So again, I'm giving him a lot of credit on the real politic front, but I think broadly speaking, in, in a time of such anxiety, uh, the ability to talk to people that way was very good. Uh, there's, there, as you know, there's a substantial literature about uh, sort of for the past 20, 25 years about the rhetorical presidency and the strengths and the weakness of that. You mentioned Abraham Lincoln uh, responding to the extraordinary crisis as his predecessor, Buchanan, had not. Uh, and in part, Lincoln responds to it with extraordinary rhetoric. And yeah. he had already demonstrated this as part of the reason he was chosen as, as the candidate by his party uh, for president. Uh, but but that, that also is a, a double-edged sword in a way, right? And you could, you could have people who's... Uh, so let me, let me phrase the question this way. It, is there a kind of an inverse relationship between our mode now of selecting presidents? say for the past 20, 25 years, which places a premium on electioneering rhetorical skills, right, through the primary selection process, and not on your experience in government necessarily, okay? Is, is, is there a, 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 an unintended inverse relationship between placing a premium on rhetorical skills and on the other hand, not people in office not entirely prepared for the crises that do come? With, with, I'm not sure I want to give you a nickel for the rhetorical skills of the of the array of candidates I've seen from both parties over a rather <laughs> long period of time. So it's it, it, the, the 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 system we have for choosing the presidency is is just a dreadful mistake on on so many levels. Um, the kind of rhetoric, right? That that uh, that even as recently as, as FDR, uh, the uh, candidate was able to employ, uh, was uh, not geared simply to sort of being advertisements for myself, right? And, and wasn't nearly as much geared toward attacking the other members of, of one's own party. I mean, this is the suicidal aspect of the way we conduct that business. So the whole setting is wrong. The whole format is wrong. Uh, and we don't get much in the way of rhetoric. Um, uh, you know, there are, there are a few bright moments of rhetoric, uh, uh, but on the whole, uh, it's, it's pretty, um, pretty bad. So this, is, this goes back to one of your opening points. That this, uh, so implicitly, the distinction is between communication on the one hand, and rhetoric, yeah. meaning some, and, and, and so let me try getting at this another way. Obviously, the old model of selecting presidents, uh, dominant during the 19th century, you know, as, as you know, uh, sort of from the Jacksonian era onward, the Van Buren uh, party system, that produces some, some better and some, and some real dud. You know, I just mentioned Buchanan, right? Um, but but FDR is, in a way, a success, you could say, because he is an immensely experienced person, right, to put himself forward as a candidate oh, yeah. in, that, in that crisis, because he's been a governor. He's been through immense personal suffering and crisis and, and hardship. And Thanks. so that the system of party nomination produces, in a way, the, the, a, a per, not maybe the person needed in the moment, but a kind of person who was needed in a crisis moment. And you make an important point. The old system, which I cherish, produced some real clunks. 
and uh, you know, there, there, there's no process in politics that's always going to have good results. But broadly speaking, to make the choice of the candidate a deliberation among seasoned politicians who have some understanding of what it means to govern uh, is a good idea. And to, and, to, and to destroy that is a very bad idea. So let me, in just a few minutes we have left, let me finish on this sort of theme that one, one of the, you, you said earlier, you defended our constitutional order as, as wisely designed. Uh, that that you, you can take any principle, including the principle of executive energy and agency, you can take a principle too far, but for over 200 years, our constitutional system has had a capacity to, to respond. That's if right. a principle goes too far, you mentioned the NIRA. Well, it's a good idea to experiment, try something. Turns out to have been a really bad idea, and the Supreme Court responds and says, you know, that, that might be a bright idea somewhere else, but it does not fit our constitutional uh, system, especially uh, the idea of individual rights and economic, free economic activity, property rights, et cetera. So, so this principle, right, even in crisis, you, we do want energy and we want activity, but, but there is a, there's a sort of a deeper principle in our political culture and constitution of be, being wary of a, taking any one principle too far. Yeah, and yeah. also let's remember that, that even though this is a difficult thing, we really do always need to separate emergency from non-emergency. We are going to give license to the executive in times of crisis because they really are crises. And things have to happen, and they have to, and we had to beat Hitler, you know. But most of the time, and of course, we're living in a certain kind of time of crisis now, but mostly we don't live in crisis. If things are called crisis, and we have a war on this and a war on that, but that's, that's foolish rhetoric, right? It's very important. A certain kind of sobriety comes from understanding that mostly uh, the, the, the need to stay within the constitutional frame is more important than some particular result. And uh, it's only rarely uh, that emergency should, allow, should be allowed to, uh, to just uh, uh, put everything else uh, in the shade. Uh, Sean, do you have a final comment or question? I've got one last one, but go, go ahead. So we've got two left that are on civil liberties that connect like this, so might as well try to grab those in real quick. Um, so to what extent, uh, so we have a question asking, so to what extent was Roosevelt's war with the Supreme Court fundamental or peripheral to his sense of mission? Uh, and the other one um, saying, to what extent, uh, what role will government take in our liberties um, to prevent pandemic from spreading? So if you want to do either of those sort of con law -y questions in our, what's left. Okay, I'm, I'm I'm having a little trouble understanding. Could you say, give me one of them? Sure. Of them. The first one, um, so to what extent was Roosevelt's war with the Supreme Court fundamental or peripheral to his se sense of mission? So I used to say, was he very particularly constantly animated by going after the Supreme Court, or was that just kind well, of something? No, he, was, he, he was happy. These, these old codgers died. He, he put his people on. Uh, you know, in a way, he won the war. He lost the battle. He won the war. Uh, but it was very important that he lost that battle because for the for the future of the court. And of course, I hear all these commentaries uh, wanting to do court packing again, and I break out in hives. Well, let me let me follow up in the same spirit, right? Uh, that uh, because of the international crisis brewing, Hitler invading Poland. An, uh, 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 a pact with the Soviet Union, uh, it seems like there's a catastrophic war going on. Uh, Roosevelt is a, and his party are able to change the constitutional order in a way. It was an informal principle, nowhere written, uh, but established by George Washington and, and accepted by every successive president. You don't serve more than two terms. Uh, but yet, after the crisis passes, right, the, the, co the combined crisis of the economic depression through the New Deal and then the Second World War, the Congress responds and yeah. passes the constitutional amendment and says, okay, that was then, but going forward, we don't see a reason to go to do that again. 
Yeah, well, isn't, that, isn't that splendid? That, that's just splendid. By the way, it probably was important that FDR served the third term. Uh, there really was a lack of internationalist leadership uh, uh, in, in, in either party. Uh, well, Wendell Wilkie, well, maybe Wendell Wilkie could have pulled it off, who knows. But, the, but, to, but to do away with that possibility was a, was a very good idea. Well, we have reached the limit of our time, so I have some closing uh, remarks and some information to close out this webinar. Uh, we thank everyone for joining us for this fifth webinar in the Pandemic Dialogues, the first and the second part of the series on reckoning and recovery. Uh, please check our website. Again, it's scetl.asu.edu to see the schedule of upcoming webinar discussions about reckoning and recovery. Uh, among the topics we'll address uh, and drawing on, as we did with tonight, drawing on lessons uh, from, from past crises is how the COVID pandemic might affect uh, the present and the future of United States politics and policy. One topic will be relations with China. Another topic will be the status of our trust in science and technology to improve human affairs uh, coming out of this uh, COVID crisis. Uh, and a third topic we scheduled is ideas about economic recovery after this extraordinary uh, public health and economic crisis. So again, please check our website, schedule.asu.edu for details and to register for those uh, webinar sessions, the registration is open. Uh, if you enjoyed tonight's discussion, we also again recommend our podcast in the Pandemic Dialogue series. Look for that on our website, on iTunes, uh, other podcast platforms. You can connect via Twitter with the faculty conducting that discussion of Camus' novel, The Plague. Uh, we have got six episodes of uh, that dialogue uh, about Camus already posted on our website and elsewhere in podcast land. On our website, you can also find recordings of four prior webinars in the pandemic dialogues on Thucydides, on Boccaccio, on Edgar Allan Poe, <clears throat> and our last one on the zombie craze in uh, recent American pop culture. It'll take just a day or two for Joe Martin and our colleagues to get a recording of tonight's webinar up on our website, so look for that. So in closing, I should thank our colleagues in the school who do all the work behind the scenes to make this webinar possible. Dr. Carol McNamara, our Associate Director for Public Programs. Dr. Luke Perez, helping us with questions behind the scenes. Joe Martin, our Communications Manager. Morgan Raddick of our events team. Thanks again to our guest, Professor Mark Landy of Boston College. Thanks to my colleague, Sean Beinberg from the school for joining me on this panel. Thank you everyone, be well, be hopeful, and good night.